Hey everybody and welcome to a new episode of Design Cinema. This is Fain Sui speaking and we are at episode 106, getting a job in the games industry. So I want to focus on games for this episode and because films is a whole other beast and we'll talk about that perhaps in a later episode. And the reason why I want to record this episode is because of what I'm seeing lately online as well as even from some of our students is that the content that they're building for their portfolio right now doesn't match what the industry is looking for, especially for a junior entry level portfolio. Yeah, so there might be a lot of artwork being done. You guys are spending a lot of time drawing these cool things. However, these images are not matching what you will be doing on your job. Uh, what I see mostly are actually illustrations meant for post-production or meant for marketing. For example, box covers, maybe uh, instruction inserts, maybe some artwork of the character that I could put on the website for, again, marketing purposes. But they're not the kind of content we look for when we're building the initial pre-production phase of a video game, which we need to generate ideas. We have to put the world together. We have to put a ton of stuff together. So, And that's where a lot of junior artists' roles come in. So today's episode, I'm going to break that stuff down for you guys. So maybe it'll help you plan your portfolio a little bit better. And you might actually have a chance to get into the industry if you have the proper content in your portfolio. All right. So today's episode might run pretty long. Seems like you guys like this kind of long format classes. And I like it as well. It makes it much easier for me to produce because I don't have to edit anything. I just kind of run through. If it takes a while, it takes a while. So uh, let's jump in. So today... First, let me make sure I got my, my, whoa, wrong pen. Okay, got my marker here. All right, so today's class will be covering a few things. First, we're gonna be talking about the industry a little bit. Okay, first understand how the industry works. I know this might be a repeat, especially if you've seen my past epi uh, episodes, but I think it's always good to review some of these very standard things so you know why I'm making this episode and why everything here uh, is pertained to this topic here, which is what the industry is about. Next, I'm going to talk about the daily tasks a junior artist tend to do uh, on your first job. Okay, and we'll show some examples of that. Based on that, this is the type of portfolio content you need to generate. Again, this is no, it's, it's very common sense, right? If this is what the industry wants you to do, then you have to show that in your portfolio. You can't be doing portfolio pieces that have nothing to do with what the industry wants uh, for your first job, right? So we're going to be connecting these two. Next, very briefly, I'm going to talk about salary expectations since we are talking about getting your first job. So kind of cool to cover that. And finally, I'm going to share a little bit of my first industry experience, my first jobs. And this goes back to 20 something years ago. But I think it's kind of fun for you guys to see. And if you have time, I'll share a little bit of story about how I got the job, uh, maybe even how much I was making, all that kind of details, which is kind of fun to share. But keep in mind that that's about 20 something years ago. So that uh, the number is a little bit off from today. All right. So. Let's start with our first topic, understanding the industry. Let me check my time here because I just started this episode without recording time. Okay, it's the afternoon here, about two o'clock. So I think this will run about two hours, is my guess. Okay, let's understand the industry. Uh, here is our first chart. So I got to thank uh, James Peck here. So James Peck is a, one of the founders at Brainstorm. I invited him to talk to our students a few months back and he actually shared this pyramid thing with us, which is a very good visual to illustrate what the job different positions of the, of the kind of the job industry uh, stacks up, okay, in the concept of our industry. So I just said industry like a bunch of times. All right, pardon my, uh, my, my grammar here. I just started warming up for this episode, so I'm gonna be uh, stumbling a little bit here. All right, so how does this pyramid work? On the very, very bottom, you have the junior concept artist. And if you're watching this video, most likely you want to get into the game industry. And almost about 99.9% .9 of you will enter the industry from a junior concept artist position simply because you are a lower risk for these studios. So even if your portfolio is quite good, most students are very hesitant to put you in a concept artist position or even a senior concept artist position because it's very risky. They never work with you. You don't have industry experience. You might have a stellar portfolio, but risky in terms of who you are, right? They put you as a senior concept artist. Your salary is probably quite high. You'll be leading other people. Imagine you've never done that before and they test it out on their first project. Pretty risky because what if you mess up? What if you cannot work with other people? What if you cannot take directions? All these come into play. So most studios are going to be offering you a junior artist position. So that is the biggest uh, grounding of this pyramid, right? It's the biggest chunk of job that's out there. 
The second biggest chunk, which you see, is almost about the same volume as the as the uh, junior artist, which is just regular concept artists. Okay, this is the medium banner concept artist. That's probably about 80% of your industry right there, right? M maybe not 80, maybe 60%. Your junior take about probably 20 of that. Uh, then the rest of it is the, the rest, which I'll talk about in a second here. So concept bars are responsible for pretty much everything else that goes in the games, right? We'll talk about this in the second slide here of what each position actually does, okay? But first, let's run through this pyramid. So now it gets more rare, okay? Now we have the senior concept artist. So this is generally just a few people on team. They're responsible for later, again, we'll cover the bigger things on a project. Above that, we have the art directors who oversee everyone that's uh, down here, okay, from the junior to the concept to the senior. And there are different positions for art directors as well. They are junior, they are senior, they are very, uh, very, very senior. But here, let's just say they're art directors. And above them all, in the very, very tip of the pyramid here is a creative director. So this position is generally just one in an entire studio. Uh, maybe two if they have multiple studios. So very, very difficult uh, uh, job to get and you have to have a lot of experience, which the next slide would be covering. But let me just review this pyramid. Why is this so important? And why did James Peck even mention that to our students? Because uh, earlier I said about students building portfolios. A lot of portfolios content that's being built right now is almost like they're trying to be up here. Okay, the content, okay, not talking about the skill level, that's a whole other thing. If you're not good at drawing, then you don't even belong to this chart. Say you draw okay, but the content that's in this portfolio looks like they're trying to be art directors. You're building uh, magnificent worlds. You're doing these production paintings. Um, and these kind of things are pretty scary when we looked at that you have no experience in the industry. However, you are building things that's very, very high level. Uh, so studio has, uh, I guess, had a hard time judging, okay, do we hire this person? Because can you do the simple things? Because we're not gonna hire you in as an art director if you've never done it before. We're definitely not gonna hire you as a concept artist or a creative art director. You're gonna come in as a junior artist, but your portfolio don't show anything a junior artist does. So what if you put you in that position? Can you do it? And the thing I hear a lot uh, online is also, hey, junior stuff seems easy. Why should I do the easy stuff? Well, that word right there is very, very scary. The word easy, okay? Give it a try. Because what you think is easy is actually one of the hardest thing to do. And we'll go through that as this, uh, as this presentation uh, uh, goes forward. You'll see the simplest stuff, actually some of the hardest stuff. Some of the harder stuff, like the big production paintings, actually is not the hardest stuff, for, especially for those with more experience. It becomes uh, almost secondhand. But for senior artists, even for myself, to do some very junior artist stuff, like breakdowns and worthos, they take a lot of time, a lot of referencing, and a lot of labor work. And that's where the junior artists come in, and you have to have that in your portfolio. Okay, so keep this in mind. This is where we start, and today's entire episode will be focusing on this bottom chunk right here. Everything that's required to for you to build a junior concept artist portfolio to get into the business. Okay, uh, some of you might be watching and go, "Hey, I know a friend who got in as a senior concept artist or a concept artist in general." Yes, there are cases. Always, there are always exceptions to the rule. I've seen young kids at age 19 join like a senior concept artist. I met them, but they're very, very rare. Maybe one out of a hundred, maybe even one out of two hundred. So if you're that one, okay, very good. But what if you're the other 199 and you're gonna follow that? road well good luck because most likely you're not going to build a portfolio as good as that one person so we're going to start here in and actually building a portfolio aimed for a junior artist position is actually not that difficult if you take the time to do it it's actually less difficult for than for you without any experience to come up with your own ip okay i'm going to talk about that as we go forward here all right next let's just break this these positions down just a tiny bit so you see all the points i just made earlier okay so starting from the very bottom the junior concept artist so you'll be supporting, actually, let's start from the top because I think it makes more sense. Let's start from the very top. Let's start with the creative director. So this is actually an executive position. So you'll be working with the CEOs, the CFOs, or all the execs of the company. So to get into this job position, you generally have to have about 15 to 25 years experience. And what does a creative director do? They generally are in charge of green lighting and deciding new games. So this is a pretty important job, right? So imagine uh, you're making the next Tomb Raider game. Do they decide, do we make a sequel to Tomb Raider or let's just start a whole new IP? We're gonna put Tomb Raider on the shelf and we're gonna use the same team and build a new IP. That's a big decision to make and generally that decision is made between executives, creative director, uh, your finance people, right? Marketing, there's a bunch of people involved, but the creative director is de definitely involved in that process. Or even green lighting a new direction. For example, Tomb Raider has been kind of photo real for the past uh, four or five games. Well, they could be like, maybe the next Tomb Raider, we go cartoony, right? We go totally Pixar stylized Tomb Raider. 
who makes that decision, right? What's right, what's wrong? Well, creative director is definitely involved in that process. So that's why you need a lot of experience to kind of almost guess what the market want this kind of product, right? And you're responsible for that. So it's uh, pretty important. So under that, we have art directors. So they oversee and define the overall art direction. So once the game is set, for example, the next Tomb Raider is going to be stylized, right? Kind of, uh, say, Overwatch, right? It's not completely cartoony, completely Pixar, but it's stylized. Well, the art directors they're going to hire will have that style defined for the initial uh, phase of the pre-production. So there, that way, everyone coming into the team will know exactly what this um, project will look like. Okay, so the art directors are pretty important. Uh, to get that position, you also need about seven to 15 years of experience. Seven, if you're working for a probably a newer studio. 15, if you're working for a very established studio because the, uh, the, the line you have to kind of get into to get to that position in a major studio takes a long time to get in, right? Because a lot of people are waiting because these people are always moving upwards. So if you just got in, you're gonna have to stand in line and wait for that senior artist to become art director, that art director to go somewhere else or get to a different project, and then you shift yourself to the art director position. So it takes about that time. Okay, under that, we have the senior concept artist, and this generally takes about five to seven years of experience to get to that position. And what they do is that they're responsible for the major characters and environments, right? So we, we generally call it the main screen time. For example, you're working on a Star Wars game, then the TIE fighter, the X-Wings, the Jedis, the Sith, you're going to get all that because they get the most screen time. So everything they do is going to become, uh, again, heavy screen time, they're going to be making toys, they're going to be on marketing stuff. So that stuff has to look pretty cool because it's going to be featured all over the place. And generally that job is given to the senior concept artists and they deserve it. They've been in the studio for a while. They're very good at what they do. You don't have to art direct them to death. They know what they're doing. So you want to give them the most important key things of this game to them. Okay, under that, we have the concept artist, which is responsible for flushing out everything else. Okay, so let's go back to, say, Star Wars. Now they'll be doing some of the planets, the interiors, the, uh, the which are costumes, the props, the vehicles. But they're not going to be touching the major things, like the X-Wing that's going to go to the senior. You'll be doing that little fighter that flies out and gets blown up in two seconds, right? It's cool, but it's on screen for two, three seconds. So that's generally what a concept art uh, does. And of course, below that, we have the junior artist position. So what these guys do is we support everything up here, okay? You're gonna be doing a wide range of tasks, uh, which I'll show you, and you have to be pretty versatile, but you're also going to work pretty hard because you're not gonna go in there. They're not gonna get a junior artist with zero experience and say, hey, for the next Tomb Raider, you decide what it looks like, right? We have this $5 billion IP, you have no experience, but we're gonna make you be responsible. That doesn't happen, okay? If it does, you're pretty lucky to have the opportunity, but it's pretty, pretty rare. So your job is to handle all the, the grunt work, essentially, that comes down the pipeline. And, uh, and today we'll talk about that. And the thing is, this industry is like any other production industry. We're not really artists, right? Uh, you heard me saying that many, many times. We use drawing as a communication tool, but we're not artists, we're designers. Our job is to sell this product. The end result is a video game, not your art. The people buying these games don't care about the concept art, right? Maybe a very, very small percent, like maybe 3 million units sold, 30,000 people maybe like your art, uh, but the rest of it, they don't, they don't care about your concept art. They want the video game, right? So our job is to support this massive machine, right? That pushes this game out and you're just part of that. And you have to grow with experience and go up and up and up and up. So if you're building a portfolio and not understand how this works, well, that's what I see online quite, quite a bit these days. I'm looking at these content going, wait, that's marketing art. That's illustration. That's a, that's a keyframe. That's a storyboard. The, no matter how well you draw it, the, the company's not looking at you as a concept artist, it's looking at you as like, okay, maybe in a few years I'll hire you to do a uh, box cover, or maybe I'll hire you to do a offshoot comic book based on the IP, but that's not a concept artist in the initial stage of a game design, okay? All right, all right here. So continue to understand the industry. Let's break down the production pipeline just a bit, okay? So here's the overall production pipeline. You, you guys are probably pretty familiar with this, but uh, let's just repeat it one more time. So pre-pro, pre-production, generally lasts about a year uh, to a year and a half to two years, I'm our longest. So this time has increased quite a bit in the last, uh, I'd say 10 years or so, because games are becoming a lot more complex than when I was around. Back when I was around, pre-production lasts maybe three months, you know, six it, for, for a really big project. But nowadays, it's pretty common to do about a year to year and a half because the amount of stuff that's in these 
huge video games, right? So the actual production, so this is where you do the 3D, the animation, the sound, the gameplay, there's a ton of stuff. It takes about three to six years, depending on the size of your game. So something like Red Dead Redemption, I heard it took about six to seven years. So that's a long time. Uh, if your company is strapped for cash and you need to push something out three years before you run out of money, so you gotta get this stuff out. And then post-production is generally your marketing stuff, last minute finishing, you're dealing with a lot of, for example, influencers, right? all the stuff that kind of puts marketing forward. So that's all done in post. And this is where a lot of the portfolio content I'm seeing out there fits into. If you're doing illustration, like just characters standing there looking really nice, that's a marketing piece of art, right? That's done after the game is already finished. So if you're building nothing but that, you're not gonna come in as a pre-production artist because the co portfolio content, even though, like I mentioned many times, even though you draw it super nice, the content is not correct. Um, I always like to make analogies, right? So say you want to become a doctor, you're not going to go to a hospital with no experience and say, hey, I want to become the head surgeon of your hospital. And they're going to ask you, that's not how it works. Have you done basic surgery? Like, no, that's too easy, man. Basic surgery, I, that, that's easy if I'm a surgeon, right? If I'm a head neurosurgeon, basic surgery is below me. So I only do head surgery. So I kind of know a little bit of it, but I really don't know how to do it. I have no experience. Hospital think you're crazy. They'll be like, no, you start at the very junior, you do internship, you become a nurse, you know, whatever the pipeline is to become a, a doctor, you're gonna go through that. It takes probably 10 years, to, maybe 15, to become a, a head surgeon. Same thing in this business, right? Again, few will jump the line, like Doogie Hauser <laughs> on the TV show. So he, he jumped the line, but those are very, very rare. So most likely you're gonna start the junior position and work your way up, okay? So that's the one to two year pre-production. So let's take that pre-pro line and break it down further, okay? So since that lasts about two years, the first six months is where your senior art directors come in, your concept artists come in, and they define this game. So they're doing the keyframes, they're doing the production paintings, they're doing the style exploration. And this stuff is really cool looking. They're awesome. There's the kind of stuff you see on ArtStation all the time. Fancy finished products look beautiful, very eye-catching, just amazing stuff. And they also feature these in art of books. But the thing is, for junior artists, when they see this, they think, that's what concept art is. But actually, this, this takes a very, very small percent of what we actually do for work. And you, we'll, we'll get into that as we, uh, as we go forward here. But that's, that's their job. Junior artists, very rare are involved in this. Okay, again, if you're lucky, maybe. But they don't even hire you before this is set because a lot of this stuff could actually go away. They could be doing this for six months and the head production be like, hey, you know what? We don't want to do Tomb Raider as a cartoony style no more. Let's go back to photo reel, scrap everything. Let's try it, redo it again. So at this point, it's kind of not really financially good to bring in junior artists at this point because let the senior guys handle that. Let them run through the early stage of pre-pro, define the style, and then we hire a bunch of juniors and uh, regular concept artists in. Right? So there, generally this lasts about six months. Now we're going to kind of a production in pre-production. Okay. Now that the game is set, these guys have already defined what everything's gonna be. Now the juniors come in and look at all these things you have to do, okay? Line art cleanup. You're doing detail breakdowns. You're doing variations. We're gonna do set dressing. We're gonna do war throws and turnarounds, production views, color keys, aiding 3D production. And all this stuff is prepared in a package that's gonna go down to production, right? These guys down up here. Production is gonna look at your art. They're pretty much like blueprints, essentially. The 3D artist is going to look at your concept art and they're going to build these into actual assets to be used to put the games together. Okay, So this takes about a year and a half. Okay, Generally, a bunch of concept artists involved, up to maybe 10, 15, depending on the size of your game. And all that is being uh, used to produce all this blueprint, essentially, to guide production. Okay, So your portfolio has to have this in it. If you only have beautiful art, but you don't actually show the understanding of the production pipeline, studios are pretty hesitant because they don't know if you can actually handle doing this kind of work. And going back to that thing of, hey, this looks easy, you know, color keys is easy, or work those easy, why should I put that in portfolio? Well, you have to, just like a nurse or first year doctor, they have to do the basic surgery. And I mentioned doctors a lot because my families are doctors. And so I see my sister go from a kind of, a, I don't know what they call it, like a, it's like an intern doctor. She did that for like two, three years, right? And really working really crazy hours, like midnight shifts and stuff like that, right? They do all these crazy things. And now she's up there because it's about 10, 15 years ago she was doing that. So they also have to go through the same pipeline. You cannot jump ahead. And no matter how good you are, you have to do some of these basic things. All right. Now let's some, show some industry examples. Uh, there's some lawnmower outside. Hopefully it doesn't show up on audio. Okay, so here are just some screenshots just to show you that when you play video games, some of this kind of stuff just goes right by. 
But if we actually break it down, you'll see how much work is involved in putting this together, right? Let's look at this one. Here's Witcher. We have Red Dead here. We have a Dark, Dead, Dark Souls 3. And of course, Cyberpunk has not, it's not out yet, but it's a screenshot of the in-game. So if you look at Witcher as this screenshot, okay, let me make sure I have a pen here to write. With a lawnmower, it's pretty uh, uh, annoying, but uh, nothing I can do. Let's just run, pretend to class. Check the time here. All right. So here's uh, Geralt walking in that little path here. Let's just see how many objects in here, right? There's a chicken. There's like someone sweeping the floors, a door, right? We've got the roof. we got this stuff, chimney, house back here, another house back here. Different design, by the way. Another design, this design. These two are kind of similar, but not exactly. We have a uh, totem of some kind. We have fences. We have a, uh, I, know, I guess, a clothes hanger stuff. We have some bags down here. It looks like a fur thing, a cage, another shack with stone, grass, fence, dirt, rock, sand, uh, two different type of plants, right? A different kind of chicken, row sign, storage shed. I don't, I thought that's chicken coop maybe, or right, some kind. All right? Then of course we have background mountains. We have trees on that. Of course we have the lead uh, character over here. Okay, who's putting this together, right? Uh, so the team, the assembling the game editor is using all these assets to put the world together. But who's making these assets? These are not generated by AI. This cannot be done with just a pre-production uh, kind of a photo bash art, right? That's the early stage of capturing the look. But somebody has to go in there and detail this stuff out. And we're not going to be doing this at a 3D stage. That's too risky, right? You can't tell a 3D artist, hey, put together a medieval town without any concept art. That's pretty risky because they can make mistakes. And by then, building a 3D asset, putting a town together may, might take months. Whereas a concept art, maybe days. So you want concept art to at least establish what this looks like. And all these things are done by somebody. And that's done by a combination of art directors, junior, senior, regular concept artists. And they put this stuff get together, right? If you look at Red Dead, here's uh, Arthur Morgan's little camp, right? Pretty simple. You play the game, you don't pay attention to this kind of stuff. But you start to break it down from like, as a designer, we look at this kind of stuff and go, man, look how much stuff is here. And this is a bare bones. This hasn't been even upgraded yet. So if you play this game quite a bit, he gets all this stuff everywhere, right? So, but just looking at that, look at the props involved, right? So we have the main wagon. We got the light. We have the tarp on top. We have two crates done quite nicely. They're not 90 degrees. He's got like a photo frame. He's got some letters. He's got a drink. He's got a table. He's got a book. He's got a frame. He's got like a can right there. He's got his cot, his bed, right? He's got a thing where he changes clothes. He's got the strings that tie all these two together. He's got this little support beam over here, right? All this stuff, somebody has to come up with it because in real world, this doesn't really exist in a way. This is being entertainmentized to be kind of fun, right? And in the real world, they probably, actually I'm not exactly sure how they sleep. I'm guessing this is a kind of combination of real and entertainment put together. And somebody has to do this. Uh, again, you cannot just get a photograph from the 1800s, you know, they have photos of this from the early days and throw that to a 3D artist and go, hey, build Arthur's camp. They're of course gonna do concept art. And that concept art, who knows who's doing it? It could be junior, it could be senior, but somebody has to design this out to fit the gameplay, to tell the story correctly, to make sure these props are viewable, right? Because as you stand here, you can see all these photos up here, right? They put all these details in here. The stuff you do in the game start show up all around you. I think other camp members give you gifts, they show up on the table. All that stuff is planned. And concept art plays a major role in doing that. So as a supporting concept artist, you have to show this in your portfolio. Can you do this type of work, right? Let's jump through, let's look at uh, Dark Souls. Uh, here, this is the first boss from Dark Souls 3, so the boss is already dead at this point. But it might look simple, but look at the amount of stuff that's in here, right? The boss is first here, he's kind of sleeping, this uh, crazy you know, monster of some kind. Uh, so they designed this nice circle to kind of make him into an iconic location. Then we got the water. Then we have stone, all broken up, it's not 90 degrees, really well distributed stone design here. We have really nice little staircase, different kind of stone structure here. We have grave, then we have this wall, then we have upper wall, then we have background, we have trees going here. Tons of stuff, and look at this front door detail, right? We have the main door, then we have two side doors, very classical design element here. Nice staircase, then a kind of a round, more smooth uh, decline into the pit of water, make you step through water before you go back to stone. Lots of material transitions, a lot of sound transitions, uh, and a lot of form transitions. This stuff is experienced things, right? This is experienced design here, and that has to go through some kind of concept art. Again, you're not gonna build this just from 3D, unless you really, really trust the 3D art department to deliver the first time really perfect sets without using concept art, but pretty unlikely, okay? Even as a sketch, we wanna run through this to make sure that we're getting the right thing we wanna do, okay? And of course, you have to consider gameplay as well, how big the space is. So. 
all this work, somebody's doing it. This is not, you don't tell the AI, go generate me a uh, Dark Souls 3 boss level and just make it. People are doing this and people is you. And you, to get that job, has to show that in a portfolio. Okay, last we have Cyberpunk over here. So this game's not out yet, but again, level detail, right? We've got the, the table, I guess that's a cigarette thing. It's got some, I don't know what that is, a cell phone thing. Is it playing some kind of game? They got some beers on the floor, got some trash. Got some other kind of trash. Got an arcade. We got four characters here with different costumes on. One, two, three, four, yeah. Uh, and then these guys also got different costumes on. Got two TVs back here. We got a uh, metal shed, different roof. Uh, look, look at all this stuff, right? So I apologize for the uh, lawnmower sound outside. I hope that is not too loud on the uh, on the recording here. But just in case, let me uh, take a pause here to see if he stops because this is a good time to take a pause and we'll continue. Okay, so let's back here. A lot more has stopped, so let's hope he remains shut uh, down here. So let's continue to the next uh, quick example. Okay, and again, I'm showing you this to sh uh, because I, as you watch the you know, Let's Plays on YouTube or even if you're playing a video game yourself, you kind of just go right past these kind of things. Then you slow down and realize how much work there is in these levels and these characters of their costumes. There's so much content. And they realize that this is all done by somebody. There are humans involved in making these levels. And if you want to get a job, you got to fit yourself somewhere in this in this stage, right? Even if you're a 3D artist, you got to look at this and go, man, look at all the stuff they're building here. Do I have that in my portfolio? If you're a sound designer, you got to like, ooh, what are all the sounds taking place here? We're concept artists. So we're looking at, the goes, and looking at these and go, do I have this kind of content in my portfolio? Okay, let's run through these real quick. This is Deus Ex, a uh, human... Man, oh, mankind Divided, sorry, is the newest one. So this is his headquarters, right? Adam Jensen's uh, little secret base underground. So look at the amount of stuff that's in here. And this game is a few generations old. This is four years ago, maybe sometimes around there, right? So look at the nice design guy here, right? You got like boxes here. Let me show on a different layer, okay? We have a floor panel that's been uh, offset from 90 degrees. Nice little touch because IT is kind of working on some stuff because it's a temporary station is set up. So they're kind of capture that temporary look. Uh, which is quite cool. We've got pillars. We have, uh, I think those are microphones or lights of some kind. Some of these, look at all, there's too much stuff to circle. Okay, wires and uh, things. I've got servers. I've got another light here. I've got a bathroom door right there. Uh, this kind of uh, walkway, stairs, wires, well, dividing walls, tons of workers' tables, servers. Uh, look up here, these wires running up to these, uh, to these loudspeakers, uh, anchor points for the wires, more dangling, uh, more television screens, big television screen upstairs, Kind of cool little lights, very cyberpunk stuff, right? More TV news lights, red lights for warmth, so much stuff. And this doesn't come together by itself, it comes together by hard work, okay? And this is what you want to see in your portfolio. Let's look at it. here's speaking of Tomb Raider, here's a just a very random shot. And I chose this on purpose, just a very mundane shot of Lara talking to, uh, to a local here in the village. And first of all, look at her, right? She's got costume design, costume design, prop, robe, walkie-talkie, she's carrying a, a pistol of some kind. She's got a bow carrying arrow. Arrow has different colors in it and kind of a cool design bow going on over here. Uh, she has different hairstyles, got multi-tool down here. Lots of stuff just going on with uh, with her. And then this local guy here also has a costume design on him. See on the crate, plastic bag, trees. One plant, two plant, three plant, at least four different, uh, three different plants. Fence, shed, uh, crate, fire pit, rocks, wood board, dirt, rock, a random fence looking thing, trash, rocks, cans, water. Okay, uh, look at this walkway here. Uh, this wood here is crap. We've got these tires tied to uh, to a wooden, uh, which we call a staircase right here. Got a can canister here. Uh, more people up here. Got rope, lights, another different kind of plant. Uh, let's see, there's at least four, five different plants going on here. There's another one over here. Okay, got roots. Okay, so start circling these details. Got each one of these took time to put together. If you don't, this game will look very low budget. Right? This is what made triple A's, triple A's. They put in the time to do this. And everyone has to do their share of work. And that's where you come in. Okay, your concept art needs to show this type of understanding. Okay, let's run through this real quick and we'll get to the actual examples of what junior artists do. Okay, so here's one from D3, Diablo 3. So this is a upgrade station, right? You can upgrade these. This looks, I, don't, I haven't played this game too much, so I'm not too familiar, but I know the blacksmith could be upgraded. I'm assuming this is some kind of sorcerer station, something looks like a witch thing. So this is probably the base design. Three quarter view, very, very cool uh, angle to draw your concept art from. So this is the base design and then this is one of the upgraded levels. Uh, I'm assuming because it looks like the same place, right? So this stuff guaranteed went through a concept stage. So 
going back to junior artists saying, I don't want to do this kind of stuff. This stuff too simple. I want to do the big production paintings. I want to be responsible for the next triple A game. I want to do these big giant paintings. Well, and you're saying this comes too easy. That's junior. That, that doesn't show off too well, too well in my portfolio. Well, guess what? This is actually what the industry want to see. Because if nobody's doing this, then we're going to find someone to do it. And you can't just get someone with very bad skills to do this. This actually requires really good design skills because this is this is a major game right here. It has to appeal to millions and millions of people. So you have to have someone who understands what entertainment value is, but also willing to design things that's a little bit mundane, right? Talking about a set upgrade. So this is very much work right here. It's fun, but it is work. And who knows how many uh, stages this have? I'm guessing they have at least three to four, maybe even five stages of this. So someone has to go in there and draw every single one. Look how much props are in here. You know, let's, let's forget circling. There's way too many. They got like, cauldrons and beams and candles. Just one area is like five to six to ten, I think, uh, objects, right? So in total, there's probably about 50 objects here of different designs, right? When I take 50, that means they're not repeating. They're all individual uh, items that are not copy and pasted. That's a lot of things to consider in a very small amount of space. And same with this one. So you're going to have to show that you could do this kind of work in your portfolio, okay? All right, so... Let's jump on to the next slides here. What time is it? All right, about half an hour in. We're good. So I think, again, this class will run a little long. Let's not worry about it too much. Let's throw this away. All right. So now that we'll show you some industry examples and you guys understand a little bit about the pipeline, what a junior artist is supposed to do, let's show some actual examples of what your portfolio should contain. So for junior artists, right, daily tasks. And it's going to be a bunch of them. Okay. So here comes one of the first ones. Let me, uh, let me get a layer going here so I could draw on top of this one. Okay. So one of it is adopting design languages. So this drawing up here is actually mine, and down here is actually done by one of our assistant uh, teachers here at the school. His name is Dominique Chan. So what he does is that I assign him homework essentially the same as what our students do. And we do these before we give these homework to our students. So therefore, we kind of know exactly how difficult these assignments are, because if he runs through uh, design issues, we know that students going to run into it 10 times worse. So we try to solve these problems before we actually hand an assignment down to the student. So we kind of does do this for all our assignments, our instructor do them beforehand. And one, it serves as a nice demo. Two, any roadblocks they encounter, the students will of course encounter. But so these are some examples from that. So one of the first things is adopting design language. So let's go back to Tomb Raider. If you got hired as a junior artist and you're working on Tomb Raider, well, they have their own design package. They have certain proportions they like to cater to. They have certain kind of styling they have. And studios will generally give you maybe two weeks, maybe up to a month to adopt that particular style. Right? So I'm not talking about just drawing style. I'm talking about language style. So in this case, I'm using Fallout as a style guide. Right? The Fallout uh, IP. Right? The latest is Fallout 76. We got also Fallout 4. So they kind of have this 1950s retro look to it. Very distinct style, but it's also not realistic. They're not using the real world 1950s. They're using a stylized version. So here I have Dominique going here and kind of take that Fallout style and design a taxi, something that doesn't exist in the game, but let's imagine that they want to put a taxi in. So my initial guy came from here. Let's run through this, right? So he did some of these. They look kind of cool, but I thought they haven't capture the Fallout language exactly yet. They're close, but not quite there. And they're missing a little bit of that retro, like the fins, the space age forms, the big bubbles, and all these kind of stuff you see in the reference here. Okay, We want to capture the kind of this thing, but make something up from scratch. So I did a quick example of one uh, as a drawing, and this is generally what art directors do. We kind of set the guide and like, hey, look, this is sort of the language I want to, I want to do for this taxi here. I give that style guide down to a designer and they're going to start flushing it out. So Dominique's not a junior designer, but he's doing junior design work for the purpose of showing that to our students. So he starts generating these thumbnails. And I thought, hey, this looks pretty good. So you could do the same, right? You pick a particular design style. For example, Fallout, you could use that, right? And design something that's not kerning the game, but design something that looks like you could fit into it. Very good skill to have because if you're too familiar with what you like to draw all the time, well, what if you get onto a Fallout game? Can you design a vehicle for them? Imagine you struggle two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and you don't produce anything. Now the student is going to be pretty hesitant of keeping you around because they go, hey, our junior artists cannot adopt to our design language. So this is one of the first tasks you'll be doing in a studio. Here's a, another example of that. All right, let me make sure I'm not right there. Okay, good. So using those languages, I had Dominique explore this a little bit further. I go, hey, let's keep pushing the file look. So we have a few more designs. And as our art director, I decided to pick this one. This is one of his roughs. I thought this is kind of cool. Has that kind of 1970s Star Trek Enterprise 
uh, logic to it. It also has a UFO form, which is very popular back in, the, in that kind of design. And fall always has fall out, you know, UFO type stuff in it as well. So I liked it. So using that, he fleshed that out to a nice design. And what you see here is very, very common to what junior artists do. So you might think, hey, this is a pretty important design here. It's a taxi. But in a world like Fallout, this will not be a major vehicle. Most likely, the, the you know, what do you call it, those hover ships, those, uh, those uh, Brotherhood of Steel, whatever they use, that's a pretty major thing. The power suits, those are major things. That's going to go to a, your lead concept artist or art director. But something like this, like a pickup taxi, that could go to a junior because it's not detrimental if you take a long time to do this or if you mess up the first uh, version. It's okay because this is not a major set piece will give the junior guy some time to flush this out. So this came out great. Uh, I really like this design and it really does feel like it could belong in a Fallout universe, right? A little taxi in the back. And I have some requirements for him. I told him that the power suit must be able to fit inside, uh, that uh, it has to have good view because I want this to be a real time uh, travel. So it's actually a replacement of fast travel. So instead of having a load screen, you're actually sitting here and you can see the 3D world go by. So therefore we want a nice viewing angle for the player to see uh, as they travel across the world. Uh, as a bonus, I wanted a little receiver to put down the floor to call this taxi over and put a cap in there. I think it's got like, yeah, I see caps going here. And then the taxi will come and pick you up. He also needs to have veto. It means that you can land in any space. So we put in these uh, kind of Harrier uh, engines here so they could swivel and land vertically and then take off and fly horizontally. Yeah. So you can see here in the landing position, the engine has been pitched uh, downwards to uh, to land. So pretty cool design, very retro. And this kind of stuff, if you haven't done it before, I highly encourage you. Uh, later, I'll be uh, going down in detail of how you plan this kind of stuff in your portfolio. Okay, have at least one project in which you're going out of your normal comfort zone, just so you know, if you do get a job that requires you to do adopt your language, that you could actually do it. Because it looks easy, but it's really, really hard. Okay, let's keep going here. Next, set dressing. Uh, also very, very common. Uh, task that junior artists will be doing, and it's called set dressing the world. Okay, so once the overall art direction, art direction has been set, now you have to flush out this world. Remember that Witcher image we saw with all those different villages and the chicken and the farm? Well, somebody's doing that, and this is one of the tasks, and you'll be doing this times 100, times 150 times. Okay, the world is huge to flush all this stuff out. So here's another one which Dominique helped me do. So in the initial top right here are my sketches, so I've done that little color one there. Using that little color sketch, I drew two farms, which is similar to what I've done in episode 105, uh, the same project. There's something our students are currently working on. So Dominique took that art direction and uh, generated his own concept art based on that, but the styling has been captured, right? I told him I want a kind of a whimsical, friendly farm, very iconic, it's not exactly real, and I want an iconic chimney on there. So all those directions are being followed nicely here to produce that, and of those three, I go, hey, this one looks pretty good here, let's flush that out. So again, design language and set dressing, all that stuff is worked in here, okay? so. Set dressing the world, a ton of your job will be doing this. Okay, uh, let's see here. Here's the finished version of that. Uh, it's okay, I just draw it directly on top lines. I don't save this file, it should be okay. All right, so look at these, came out great. So here's the initial rough based on the approved design. These are figuring out in some very, because some very basic 3D underneath, right? And junior artists nowadays, pretty much everyone uses 3D, so that's just part of your pipeline. And then using that, we flushed out three different views of this farmhouse. And this is good. This could go to production now. Remember earlier, I talked about using that year and a half to put all the content together that's going to go forward to production. While using these three drawings, if I was an art director, I'll feel pretty confident to hand this off to a 3D modeler and I'm not going to run into too many problems, right? Uh, 3D models are pretty smart too. They're not going to be just following everything. They know how this stuff works. They know how to texture all this stuff. But in, essentially, this has captured about 90% of what I want in this scene. And the 3D artist from that point on will start doing painting directly on top of 3D, right? And that's later. That might be a year from now when this actually goes into production. But in terms of a piece of concept art coming from a junior art position, this is perfect. And this is what art directors want to see, production art, okay? Stuff that explains what this design is. It has multiple views, drawn well. There is no guessing anywhere. There are no photo bashing to kind of make your mind think what it is. Everything is what it is, okay? So like the hay, the roof, the different material separations, all the forms, the proportions, everything's being balanced, and this could go to production. And uh, hopefully you guys are starting to see what a junior artist uh, portfolio needs to have. And you can take a look at your own work and go, do you have these in your portfolio? If you only have big shots or just characters standing around doing something, like it's almost like an illustration, 
That's great to have, but it's not what a junior artist do as a concept artist. Okay, let's keep going here. Next, costume design. And notice I wrote costume design, not character design. So these two terms get mixed a lot. So costume design and character design, yes, they're probably done by the same person, but most likely in games, you'd be doing costume design way more than character design. Character design, you generally have the senior people do it, especially, for example, the Witcher game, right? Geralt is going to go to the elite concept artist. They're going to be doing this hero, but he's going to have a ton of armor on him, ton of different weapons. That's going to go to the junior. So your job is to do costume design. Here's some good examples. So these are my students' work now. This is not uh, this is not Dominique's. These are some of our students' is to show example. So we have, the, for example, here's some works. We've got different costume. Looks like a heavy, a medium, and a light. Very, very common for our students to do this because that's what our school is uh, telling them to do because this is exactly what the industry does, right? Off the heavy, most likely in the real world, they'll be doing 10 sets of that, 10 sets of that, 10 sets of that. But for portfolio, at least this shows that you could do variations on a costume. Here's another example on a elf female, all right? So we've got, I, I'm guessing a magician of some kind. That could be a heavy, I don't know, light. Here's a medium, all right? Different design, different styling, but similar IP. So this is very, very good stuff. And you'll be doing this a lot in the industry. Here's a really good example of what the actual industry looks like, okay? Same costume over and over and over again. And this is just for portfolio. In the real world, you be doing tons more, okay? Just costume variations. Here's a couple more, you do a front view. I think this is a wingsuit of some kind. Here's a back view, really well done. Some character expression. So there's some character design here, but this is also a costume design here. This is actually a character design, which is good to show, and costume design at the same time, because this is a not a human character. So you have to design it. So kind of this froggy alien uh, reptilian thing, right? Amphibian, I guess. And then a couple of his outfits you can see here, right? So that's same pose, different costumes very very useful in a junior artist's portfolio to show that you could do that okay next more costume designs okay same thing notice the poses are very standard we try to do these they're not exactly t pose they're a relaxed kind of a heroic pose but not jumping around they're not shooting a gun they're not doing anything because the key here is to just show the design so the 3d modelers could take this drawing here and make it into a 3d asset that is your job you're essentially drawing 3D blueprint, I mean, drawing blueprints, okay? Very clearly instructed guides to pass down to the 3D artists, which could not, might, might not even be in your same studio. They might be overseas in some other studio, right? They might be working in LA and the 3D department might be in San Francisco. This happens in the game industry. So this stuff has to be pretty clear. And look, look at the nice props that the student has in here. Some of his knives, some of the stuff he's carrying. Perfect example of portfolio content. Okay. It just shows that you are a designer. This doesn't show that you want to do marketing art. It doesn't show that you're doing book covers. Can they do it? Of course, they probably can if they want. But this portfolio is saying very clearly, my job, I want to be a designer. Here are my designs. And here's my presentation showing those designs, right? Here's another example. These are all student work from our past uh, graduates, right? So we've got some, uh, I don't know what these are, cosmic design, upper class, I guess citizens on the street uh, is my guess, right? So we've got some variations here variations here and these two are painted up just to show material uh, in a real studio this is pretty much how it's done we don't need the artist to paint all these up because that takes time all we need is just to have some because these are just variations we don't want to waste your time painting every single one up because that could take say a week we'd rather have them do many more line art to generate those styles and we use this drawing here as the material guide for the 3d artist so this will probably be generated another 10 times this will be another 10 times depending on how many the game requires. And this will be the style guide or the material guide for the 3D artist. All right, here's a couple more. You can see the line drawing, different costume designs for another elf, elf female here. Looks like a party dress, a gown of some kind. Pretty cool, right? Very different designs. A couple more, all costume stuff. Here's another one. You've got this kind of soldier with the, uh, the M4 on his, uh, his uh, shoulder here, carrying a giant machete and all the different variations that he has. This student is actually working on Baldur's Gate, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Okay, so these are good examples to have in your portfolio. Look at the layout, okay? Again, this is the kind of stuff that I don't see too much out there. I'm seeing a lot of just high level stuff that concept artists or art directors do. I don't see these low level, right? Not to say low level in a bad way, I'm talking about production level art, stuff that just shows you that this is work. This is nothing but work, okay? You're putting these things together in a pipeline to show other people how to build this into a asset. That's all they are. So the presentations also look like it, okay? Let's do a few more before I take a break, just in case the computer crashes. Okay, let's run through vehicles now. So let's just go through real quick. We've done customs, we've done set dress in the world, and we've done adopting design languages. So next one is uh, vehicles okay 
vehicles. Almost all your video games have some kind of vehicle. So here's a, this going back to Dominique again. This is a, a demo that has done for our, our class. So here we have a steamboat exterior design. Here are some variations showing the glass. He built that in 3D and then flushed it out in a line drawing to show a interior of the different spaces. So again, hopefully you can see how useful this is in a production. If this is a video game like say Dishonored or uh, even a puzzle game or even like a Diablo type isometric 3D game, all of this is so useful because we could just throw this to the 3D team, they'll do their job and flush this out even further, right? They'll take, the, take this chair and make it really cool, put cool textures. But overall, as an art director, I get it. I see that he has a diving elevator. There's a, uh, looks like a planning table. There's an old diving suit in here. So a storage room. Here's another elevator to control it. The chains, some art, artifacts here. It looks like a boat that's going off for treasure hunting. Right? Just by the way this set is dressed. Right? We've got a nice wheel here in the middle of the room. A bar here. Everything's done. So if this is goes as an art director to go, hey, this is A-OK -okay to go forward, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We're going to get something back that's pretty close to this and hopefully even better. All right? So you want something like that in your portfolio. Vehicles. Okay. Here's another example. Same from Dominique. Another class demo he's done. So here he's doing a diving submarine. Here's the exterior of the submarine. And here's a cutaway. So looking at this stuff, right? Again, it looks like work. And that's exactly what it is. Yes, we have a lot of fun being a concept artist. But our job is a job. It's our job to make products. Our job is not to look at our art and go, wow, this art is so good. I'm going to hang it in the poster and print it on the wall and just look at it all day. Our job is to take that art and push it down the pipeline. This is work stuff. That's why when you see a lot of pros, when they're outside of work, they actually do these fantastic images because they're trying to get away from work work. Okay? And unfortunately, a lot of concept artists, especially juniors, sees that and go, hey, that's what the senior guy is doing. I, I need to do that for my portfolio. Not realizing what they're doing actually is not what they do at their job. Okay? Or they're so senior, you're not going to be doing that stuff coming as a junior artist. You're going to be doing this stuff. Okay? These are perfect examples of junior art content. It's a lot of labor work, very precise drawings, very detailed, takes a long time to do, and it's presented. There's not much storytelling going on here. This is just a product. Okay? No different than designing a cell phone or designing a, a house. Right? They're product designs. And even a costume, co costume design, also product designs. Right? Look at this stuff. It's so detailed. Here's, look at this sub. If you zoom in here, it's got the little uh, ice station, uh, ice, uh, what do you call these guys? Uh, ski, ski cars, right? Uh, oxygen tanks, lockers, little control room down here, fire extinguisher, first aid kit, right? Everything's done. Here's the bunks where everyone sleeps, little hangar area, little lockers, uh, more tanks. Here's, a, here's the mess hall, right? The kitchen, looks like a buffet thing, uh, area they could sit and kick back. Pretty neat. Here's the engine, runs everything. So we've got a V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We've got a V16 <laughs> down here, right? Big old engine here. And we've got all sorts of tanks down here. A uh, little camera over here. And here's some detailed view of the bunks. I guess how the, that's how the table folds out. A lot of good design execution. And this is what art directors want to see. And we do these tutorials for our students to show them, hey, look, do it like this for your portfolio. Show that you're thinking about designing showing that you're thinking how stuff works, show that you understand how to break things down to details, right? I don't even notice this one, it's kind of cool. Look at this little sub uh, comes out from the bottom there. That's pretty neat to go exploring. Oh, I see it's right here. So here's the little cutaway uh, rover that could get away from the main sub, pretty neat. All right, nice stuff, okay? So let's run a few more, more vehicle. Here's some from our students to show you that they're doing the exact same thing. Here's a huge, looks like a cruise ship on a, on a line. It's pretty neat. Uh, and here is the cutaway of that. Look at this. Look at this thing, right? All these rooms. And beautiful stuff. This is exactly what t uh, artists need to do, what art director want to see in the junior artist portfolio. Because now we could trust you with these designs. We could give you a bunch of stuff. Because an art director, what they want to do is have a team that can help them make all these things to push the product forward. And knowing that you could do this, I don't have to babysit you. I don't have to hold your hand at every step. I know you could do this. It's already in your portfolio. We're good to go. You know how to do cutaways. You know how to make forms look good. All right, here are a couple other ones. Uh, this looks like a survival vehicle, snowmobile thing, right? Pretty neat. Some uh, details on the sides there. Here's a mech, right? You don't have to keep all these real world. You can make it fun. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, okay, in terms of what you could do. Here's a train cutaway, pretty neat. All right, it looks like a 1920s or something. Uh, train, no office, desks, right? So it looks easy, right? It looks kind of easy. Like, hey, this is boring. I want to do fantastic alien worlds and big giant space stations. Like, no, do some of this because, yes, it looks so easy. Sit down and try to do one. 
and I realized putting these little details in get, uh, together and set dressing these little tiny things takes a long time. All right, let me take another quick break here and we'll come back in a second. Okay, let's continue here. Next things you gotta do, and this one is a huge one that junior artists do a lot. Okay, variations and props. This is so common in the game industry. Unfortunately, there just isn't enough concept art in terms of what's out there to show this. But there's so much of this. You guys play video games, you know, play some Assassin's Creed or uh, what you call it, Tomb Raider, right? Uh, whatever you're playing, there's lots and lots of props and variations. So here are some examples of like just weapons, right? Look at all these different axes. Each one has to be cool and each one has to be slightly different from one another. Yes, looks boring, looks like, hey, this is easy work. Not easy. Try it, right? Imagine you have to do like 50 of these and they all have to kind of look cool. Right? How do you come up with that? Look at all these swords, right? And these are all, uh, these are back to our students again. These are our students' work. So here's a bunch of staffs or, or whatever these are called. Uh, here's a bunch of uh, swords and blades. Pretty neat. Okay, different designs. Here's even food. Okay, I, I love this kind of stuff. Look at different food. You got like kebabs here. God, it looks like that's a ribs right pretty neat so this this stuff exists in video games the thing is you just don't see it in people's portfolio especially online like then how we're gonna find someone to do this we cannot just generate these by magic someone has to draw these for us and put in the video game and that's where you come in okay look at these instruments looking little uh, water holder things great stuff okay and so useful in video game design here's a stylized one uh, crop this off a little bit different bows different canyons uh, cannons different uh, spears, different teacups. <laughs> look at this stuff, right? And it looks so, what you would call a mundane as work. And tell the truth, it is sometimes. A junior artist might be doing this for two, three months doing this, but this is how you get into the industry. You gotta go through this to rise up to concept artists. And the more you stay in the industry, the more you do, one day you'll be responsible for the lead characters, the lead spaceships, the lead whatever, okay? The main bad guy, you be doing that. But uh, starting out, somebody has to do this okay if you want to skip this and only want to do the art director stuff unless you're brilliant okay you're the one out of the hundred you could do it but the rest of you if you don't have that in portfolio well you might be struggling for years and never get in because the content you're producing is completely off tangent than what the industry wants you to do okay let's look at this last one here this is great look at all these pickaxes so many different designs and look at this compass right and look each one is pretty cool so if i was a game player and i'm collecting these it's a pretty hard decision which one I want to keep, right? I think my favorite one, maybe this one's kind of cool, but I also like this one. <laughs> they're all neat, and that's exactly what we want in an entertainment portfolio. They're not real. They're kind of built on a real concept of a compass, but they're made up in a way to be entertaining. And that is where the hard part comes in, okay? We're not just copying real world. We're taking that and entertainmentizing that. Little pouches. Look at this net, nets. Great stuff. Reminds me of the Zelda games where you capture little uh, little bugs. So this is great stuff. Look at that different. I like this triple triple net thing, uh, but neat, right? Very video gamey and very entertaining. All right, one more. Here's more variations. That previous one was props. You'll be doing these too on buildings, right? Here's a like farm or not farm, like just houses, kind of a, with a European fantasy look to it. Different styles, and you'll be doing this a ton in the industry. Here's a different one, different student, similar style, right? Drawing style we don't care about, and I mentioned that in the past. You draw a little bit more uh, sketchy. You draw a little bit more photo real. We don't care about that too much. What we care about is your design content. Okay, can you adopt the design language first of all, and two, can you produce readable content? So when this stuff goes down to the next person in line to modeling 3D, there are no questions. This pretty much reads about 95% clear. Okay, the only thing we gotta do in there is the micro details now, like a burnt nest maybe and these kind of things. But overall, it's pretty good. Yeah, look at this one. This is an Asian based one. Uh, pretty neat. Couple more. Right, let's look at this one. Different looks like a farmhouse again. We have a single room, like a, like a wide room, double room, right? Different variations, same style or same design style, different layout. And this is what a lot of video games need these days, right? Especially these open world stuff. They can't just repeat the same asset a hundred times. It's gonna look cheap. They need to produce that same asset, maybe at least ten different variations, and use different engine editors to put that world together. And those variations come from you. You have to come up with these kind of things. So of this, we'll probably do another five more. Of this, we'll do another five more. Of this, we'll do a five more. Right? And we'll kind of call this like we'll call this the L shape. We'll call this like the the I shapes. Right? We'll call this the T shape. Well, whatever. These are things that game industries generally do with these and generate. Right? And here are the interiors for those set in, uh, uh, exteriors. Right? Very good portfolio content. 
perfectly shows exactly where your skills are. No question need to be asked. Portfolios like this will get you a job almost 99% uh, sure, right? And we do have many students in these jobs. So even though their drawings might not be the best, how do they get into these triple A's? How do they get into this big project? Because we're catering a portfolio. And I want you guys to do the same thing if you're working at home. Cater a portfolio for the job that you want or the job that's out there, which is junior position. Okay, all right, let's look, go through a few of these and we'll go through the, the next stuff, okay? Oh, dude, right now, I'm still writing through daily tasks, okay? We're not done yet. There's a ton of stuff, okay? And all this stuff, you kind of want it in your portfolio. So you might have a few here, a few there, but the best to have all, okay? When, we're done, when this is done, we'll go through a quick summary of everything that we just talked about, okay? So these are breakdown drawings. Another one you'll be doing quite a lot. This is when an art director or a senior art director or a senior designer or, or whatever is above you, right, has done an overall design. Now they want you to flush this out with detail. One is to get every line in there so it's very clear. Two is to break it down. That's what we call these breakdown drawings. Is to take exterior, for example, a, uh, this is a cool little house, cut it in half, show me everything that's in there and it has to be really detailed. So look at these drawings. There's a ton of stuff here. Look at this cauldron thing. I don't, I don't know, this looks like a stove thing. Oh, it's roasting ducks. <laughs> okay, pretty cool, right? Or Okay, this is a kitchen of some kind. So this part of thing has been detailed really, really out. So art directors sometimes just draw a very rough drawing. That's kind of what I do. Do a rough drawing, then we hand that down to designers and they'll flush this stuff out, okay? Requires quite a bit of skill. Here's some more breakdown cutaways, right? Look at these. So interior cutaway, exterior cutaways, really good details. The point I'm trying to make here to show with these that each of these uh, drawings I've been showing are all detailed enough to go to 3D. That's what we want junior artists to do. We don't want you to be doing kind of out there, uh, very kind of guessing what this stuff is, or kind of photo bash together. It looks kind of cool from two, two feet away, but as you get close, it's all just gibberish stuff. We can't pass that to 3D because it's gonna ask all these questions back to us. And imagine that 3D is on another side of the world. Say they're in uh, Europe somewhere and our main de design is done in LA. Well, you're gonna have all sorts of issues because they'll be asking questions at two in the morning, the ones that they answer, then it'll be delayed. So drawings like this, we push down to the 3D, not too many questions coming back because it's gonna come back pretty much exactly how you send it off the night before, the, the week before, and that's what we want, okay? So these are great stuff. Most of these guys I'm showing, they're all in the industry, by the way. These are pretty old work, probably from three, four years ago, and they're all in the, in the business, okay? So a couple more, here's a little post apocalyptic town, right? Based on Southeast Asian architecture, almost like Singapore houses, pretty neat. Okay, line drawing, clean, uh, clean, well designed, well laid out, entertaining. And that's what you want. Okay, so that's breakout, breakdown drawings. Here's a few more examples of breakdown drawings, cutaways. The reason why our school do a lot of these cutaways is because they are done a lot in the industry, but they're not shown online too much or not shown uh, in art of books. But the thing is, if you play games, you gotta realize all these interiors, someone's filling all these details out. Who is doing it? Well, it's you, right? You're doing it. So here's a few more examples of these cutaways. These are great. Here's a kid's house, right? So by looking at even this one drawing, I know that this designer here has a lot of common sense, knows sort of how the house is laid out, how to capture the fun. This kind of has the, almost like a 1980s vibe to it, right? We have this little corner room here. Look at this here. This kid here is, looks like into music. Got this great little nook here. Uh, great design here, a little under area here to watch TV little couch, got a VCR up here, step up here, closet, we got the little bunk bed here, where a bed above his uh, area, it looks like he's got a lot of caps. Look at the amount of details here, great design. For our art director, we love this stuff because this it captures everything we want and makes our job easy, right? All we gotta do is, hey, this looks great, push it, through, push it down to production, right? So look at this bathroom, really neat. And uh, I think this is the same designer here, different kids room, looks like a twins, twin, like twins room, I guess. Uh, look at that, different, I think this is a basement, right? going down to the basement, they got a play area, look at all the Lego toys down here, uh, bunk bed, two different beds, right, two different uh, kids here, there are computer stations, two different computer stations, neat stuff, almost no art direction needed, let's just push down to production, right? and here's just a few more, here's the Egyptian bar, which is a cool concept here, uh, got a hangout for, with the Egyptian theme, uh, so this student did a really good job entertainmentalizing a uh, ancient culture here, right, Pretty nice, look at all that detail. Okay, and here's some stylized stuff, just to show you that you could do a cartoony style. This is a very stylized design of a captain's room. I think this might be on a ship. Look at all this stuff, so detailed, right? And this is the kind of stuff that I'm not seeing so, seeing so much in portfolios. It's just that this here, it's just labor work. It's fun, I'm sure the artist did this, had a lot of fun doing it, but also it's a lot of work. It takes 
hours of hours to do this. Uh, line joins to this caliber takes time. Okay. Here's another stylized, looks like a witch's kitchen. So cool, right? I love looking at this kind of stuff. So, because it looks so entertaining. All right, let me take a sip of water here. We're almost done here with the junior artist job stuff, okay? Uh, last one, and this becomes rare and rare. So, as you guys notice, the way I've done these is according to the amount of work you'll be doing for each of these subject matters. This last one here is production shot details. You'll be doing some of this, but pretty not not as common as the stuff you saw earlier. So let me explain what this are, what this is. So, senior artists or generally or art director might give you something like this. Okay, a rough sketch that's built on top of a 3D model, especially for games that has very specific gameplays. For example, you could climb. You have certain edges you have to reach. What they do is they do a gray model, something that looks kind of like this. Okay. It's a, it's a model built in 3D, so that way they know all the uh, algorithms for climbing and uh, distances are really measured correctly, so the game character can perform the moves they need to perform. So once they have that, they're going to do a rough sketch, sometimes even no sketch, and hand it off to a junior artist. Your job is to flush this thing out with line detail. And here's what it looks like, right? Here's a rough 3D, no details in there or some, but it's pretty you know raw looking. And... This is going back to Dominique again, done, done, uh, done this piece here. Uh, There's a cathedral with a magic mirror at the end. Let's look at the breakdown here, right? So you can see it's a cathedral kind of style. We've got this long staircase leading to a giant mirror. And we have two floors or three floors, three floors. One, two, three, four floors. All right, four floors up here. So that's the design that we want to flesh out in line drawing. And this is the result of that line drawing. So you see here, add a lot more details, the sconces, the statues. Uh, flushed out this mirror and this is a pretty low res image the high res you can see a little bit more of what's going on in here got the chandeliers uh, everything here is pretty much about doing line drawing on top of predefined 3d so therefore we could pass this down to production okay so this is not the most common job but we do see some of our graduates doing this for certain projects especially some of those triple a's uh they give you a huge set it's all a gray model but everything's locked in place so you cannot change the position or anything because they're all measured so you take those gray models and you draw it on top just like this and flush out all the details, right? Notice the statues um, breaking the 90 degrees, really good stuff, right? Which doesn't exist here, you see? So this beam here is just a clean beam. These statues are just skeletons, placeholders. So you cannot give this to a 3D artist because it's missing too much information. It's not enough, right? Or you're taking a huge risk uh, by passing this to 3D without the concept being approved so, because you don't know what's going to come back. So this drawing here, the statues have been flushed out. Uh, they got cloth on them, they're holding stuff, and these things are added. Uh, a lot of detail added, actually. This kind of stuff is being added, so it's not just a smooth beam. And this is, uh, this is what we do, okay, as, as designers. Okay. Here's an example from our students, a previous one from Dominique. This is actually from our students. You'll see they're doing the exact same thing. And the compositions are something that I talked about a few episodes ago about environmental compositions. They're following the same thing. Remember the one, two, three? Here's the one. Here's a two. Oh, that's a two. That's a three, right? Uh, one is this beam. That's also a one. We got the two. The windows is our three, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. Cameras are human high level. There's all the stuff that uh, we talked about. Okay. Nice, beautiful line drawing. This looks like it's a redesign of Snow White. Pretty cool. So this must be the streets leading up to our castle. And this is the uh, the, the stepmother's uh, chamber, as I'm guessing. Pretty nice. Some pretty cool stuff going on over here. Okay. Enough detail to push this forward to 3D. Okay, and here are just a few more examples of that. Here's a European street, a Japanese village looking thing. Nicely done. Here's the interior of a barber shop turned into a car fix shop. Here's a stylized village with a bunch of cats, right? Kind of monster hunter stuff. Right? The style is not something that we care too much about. We care about the content that's inside. Are you doing designs? Okay. So these are great examples. So, but again, this is quite rare. This is probably a little bit smaller than what you'd be doing on your daily job. And the most rare thing you do, but the most common thing we see in student portfolios is this last one here, production paintings, okay? They're the most things you see on ArtStation from senior people because this is fun and this is what senior artists do. They do a lot of high level, beautiful production paintings. But for junior artists, unless you're really, really lucky or you're really, really good, you're not gonna be doing this stuff. You'll be doing the stuff that we just showed you earlier. This stuff goes to seniors. However, it's good if you have the skill to do at least a few in your portfolio, but it's not the major source of your portfolio or the major content of your portfolio. These are also done by our students, and these students are all working in the industry as well, but they don't do too many. We generally require them to do a few pieces per project 
because that's all you need. And I'll show you that breakdown uh, in, a, in a tiny bit here. So you can see, so these are production paintings. They're, kind, they're fun to look at, but again, not something you'll do on a day and day out basis. This stuff goes to senior people, okay? So what you do is generally when you have this, you go in and flush out this thing, right? With the previous drawings. You break it down, you do the cutaway, you show the details, you break all these objects down into beautiful line drawings. So here's a summary. Let's just go back real quick to go through everything we've done, all right? So junior artist daily task, adopting design language. You spend about two, three weeks doing that in a studio. Next, you're gonna set trust the world. They're gonna give you a particular set, like the the uh, the countryside set or the castle village set, right? They break everything down to these sets, and they'll give you one of these, and you might have half a year or a few months to break to take that and just flush it out. Set trust the world. Okay, so common skill to have. Next, you have costume design. All right, get get it. They're gonna give you the lead character, go hero's girl from uh, Witcher Three. Now do 50 different variations of his light armor, 50 variations of his heavy armor, right? That's what we'll be doing for the next two months. So you have to show that, that you could do that skill in your portfolio, costume design. Next, vehicle design, okay? Interior and exterior. Next, uh, no, this is all student, this is all student work here. So the reason why we do interior exterior is because vehicles, oftentimes you're going inside them. So we want to see in your portfolio, do, do you understand spatial awareness? Can you design something that looks cool on the outside, but at the same time make it work you know, in an entertainment way on the inside. So that way, you know, when your uh, player gets inside them, the space makes sense, right? With can design that looks so cool, and once you get in, the player doesn't fit, for example, right? So vehicle design. Next, we have variations of just anything, props, weapons, uh, food. Have at least one or two pages of this, so we know that you could do this work. Looks boring, but you have to do it, okay? Because somebody has to do it. You can't be like, I'm a junior artist, I wanna push this to another junior artist. Well, what if you're the only junior artist? That's the job goes to you, right? So variations, okay? Variations on food, props, buildings, beams, you know, many as you can. You don't need a lot to see your portfolio. A few pages is enough, but have some. So we know that you could do it, okay? And also have the patience to do it because to do this stuff, this is just a portfolio piece, right? They're only doing one or two pages of this in your portfolio. But in the real world, you might be doing this for a month, three months, six months, who knows, right? Depending on the size of your project. And you have to have that patience and grind through it, okay? And later I'll show you my work from my first jobs and you'll see what I mean. All right, that's next is uh, cutaways, breakdowns, okay? Take a design of yours and really detail it out completely and do some cutaways to show a 3D modeler what your design is about, okay? So if you have a tank, a vehicle, a building, cut it away, show what the inside looks like, flush it out with detail, make it so there's no questions asked in terms of what you're trying to design. Here are more examples of those cutaways. Last one, very rare, production shots. Don't need too many of these, two, three pieces, all you need for pro per project, okay? Uh, detail our a 3D. A couple more examples for our students. And the last one is production paintings, which is the most rare in your portfolio. You don't need too many because you won't be really doing these in your job. So here I made a summary showing how the proportion of these jobs break down, okay? Your daily task broken down what a junior artist work on. So if you're lucky, you've been doing three to 10% of your time doing production paintings, if you're lucky. Sometimes you might do zero, okay? Or if you're really lucky, about maybe, yeah, 10%, okay? So I put here, production painting, okay? Uh, these are students' work as well, okay? So here, most of the time, you'll be doing 90 to 97% production art, okay? You're not doing production painting, production art. All the stuff we just showed you, this would be doing. Look at this variation. It's done by one of the students named Peter. Uh, look at this. This is a great example of the exterior of a house, the cutaway of the house, some props, a vehicle. It's all here. Look, even a little blueprint of the house, right? Mundane work, sort of, but this is what designs needs. Because if we go back to this little, I know it's kind of blurry here, this ancient Egypt tower. It's cool as a painting, but these kind of things serve mostly as a mood board or a color key or a keyframe to show what this game could possibly look like. But we cannot give this to 3D. It's missing too much information, too risky to trust a 3D team to build this just from this one painting. Because you don't know what comes back, right? No matter how good your 3D team is, you have to have some kind of guy, especially if you have a big game. Imagine you don't have concept art for any of it. All you have is just production paintings. You don't know what you're gonna get back because now you're leaving so much in the air. Like what, what are they gonna do with the statue? Are they gonna just make one up? Are they gonna make up the wall with half cement, half brick? Who knows, you don't know. So the more concept art we have that's detailed, the more we make sure that this project goes down the right path, okay? So because there are a lot of talented 3D artists, but when you have a lot, right? Imagine a team, uh, easily 50 to 60 uh, 3D artists on a team. You wanna make sure the design language is uniform across the board. So that's where concept art comes in, these detailed ones. And that's what we're doing. Here's some costumes, 
right? So look at that, variations. Boring pole, just standing there, but all different designs. These are one, two, three, four, five, eight, right? 11 different designs. Do this times 10 more times, right, is your, is your job. So this page here, let's just look at a little bit longer. It's pretty important, okay? The takeaway from this whole entire episode, hope it's actually on this page right here, that this is what you'd be doing as a junior artist, 95, 97% of your time. This is what you'd be doing, okay? Very few you do this, but if you look at what's out there on the internet, what people are showing their portfolios, I see 95% trying to do high level production paintings, but not done so well. And also the content is generally something pretty generic. It's generally something that are copying another concept artist or a theme that we've seen a million times before. There's nothing new about it. It's painted well most of the time. Lighting is done kind of cool, but there's no content. We can't look at that and go, hey, you're a great designer because you come up with really cool stuff. When Johnny sees that, wow, it's a nice painting, but we've seen this before and you're not showing any kind of design skills. You're showing some technical skills, but there are no design skills. So these portfolios might be stellar, but you might be finding, hey, how come no one calls me to, to, to work on these games? How come no, no one freelancing me out? It could be that your content is uh, exactly in the wrong direction, okay? All right, uh, should I take a break here or not? I think let's, uh, let's keep going here real quick, okay? Let's talk about portfolio. Since we're on the uh, topic of portfolio content, all right, so now you know the daily task. Here's what I suggest your portfolio content to have, okay, for, for junior artists. First, we're gonna try to aim for 20, 30 pieces. Now, I have some previous episodes talking about uh, portfolio content. You guys can go back and look at some of those. So some of this information probably repeats, or maybe I updated myself a little bit with that as well. Um, so you want three different projects, okay, in here. So we have project one. And let me try to break down what this means so you're not so confused, right? We have project one project two and project three, okay? They go along that way. We want six of those uh, images of a total 30 to be production paintings. Now remember we said that's kind of rare, so let's just mark let me make sure I'm the right layer here, okay. So let's mark that, okay? Six belong production paintings, and you break the rest down to production art. So I'll run this down later as, at the following piece here, but we want probably eight production art for two production paintings per project. So you have 10 images total, 20% of it is your production painting, 80% of it is your uh, production art, right? And you do that for all three projects. So you end up with six production paintings, 24 production art. Very good balanced, very good portfolio. And we're gonna separate those three into three separate themed projects, uh, which I'll run in the next slide. And this is a quick thing I just did here with some of our students' work. Uh, a lot of you guys put your work on ArtStation. So ArtStation in general, I kind of looked at my, my uh, screen here and also the one I have at home and also my laptop. And generally when I open ArtStation, I get about five thumbnails going across my browser, okay? So if I use the rule up here, you can see that I have two production paintings here, one, two, followed by eight production art, right? Two, three, right? And then two more production paintings followed by eight production shots followed by two more production paintings, and I can do the rest of it here, okay? So imagine this is your first impression, okay? Because when we look at our station, sometimes we don't even click open your files. We could tell if your portfolio is geared towards design or not just by the thumbnails the website shows you uh, because thumbnails are pretty clear and it's a pretty big box that you see that. So we don't need to open anything. We could tell if, if what you're trying to do in your portfolio, right? So the reason why I shrunk is so small here is that even at this size, okay, without cleaning anything open, this looks like a designer's portfolio. Now, obviously I have put together a bunch of different students uh, work together here, but if I only saw this and never opened a single image, I could pretty much tell that this is a junior artist portfolio and they're capable of doing all sorts of stuff, right? Just at a glance, I could tell that they're doing variations, that they could do costume design, that they could do breakdown drawings, that they could do very detailed stuff of some kind, right? I don't even know what that is, but it looks pretty detailed. It looks like they could do variations of, uh, of uh, breakdown within the uh, drawing itself. I could also tell that uh, they could do some production paintings here and there. Not too many, but I'm seeing about six here. Good enough for what I need to do. But overall, I'm seeing production art. That's important. I'm not seeing illustration-based art, okay? And again, nothing wrong with illustration. It depends on what you wanna do for your job. My episode and my career is based on design stuff, not doing marketing art, we're doing book covers and doing all that. We're doing the pre-pro making games, early stage concept art, okay? Um, 
So looking at this as a thumbnail, I could tell this particular artist here is geared towards concept art. So therefore, at this point, we might click open their files and see how good they are, right, from a technical skill uh, point of view. But this passes the first one second rule that when we go to art station. Because sometimes you go to an art station, you know right away, okay, this is not a designer. In terms of a concept, early stage concept designer, you go, okay, this guy's good, but we'll save this for later when we need a insert art or marketing art or I, I don't know, even like icons in game or cart character portraits, right? Save that save that artist for that later, but they're not gonna call you for early pre-pro, okay? So using that project, let's break this down further and we'll uh, take a pause after this. All right, so I got a red line marked over here. Let me delete that. All right, a lot of text here. But let, me, uh, let me slow this down a bit to show you how this works. Let me take a cap of water. So if you're learning at home, I advise you to do something similar to this. Okay, three projects. We got one, oh, wrong button. One, two, three. Okay, and I kind of broke down what I'm gonna do for each one. And what I wanna do with these three projects is maybe for episode 107, 108, and 109, I go in and draw the rough versions of all of them. Okay, so episode 107 is it? Okay, 107, we'll do this one. And I'll draw out the rough of these just to show you how to get them started. And this will link back to episode 105 of time management. Okay, I don't have the time right now to flush these out, neither does my team. So the only thing I could do is maybe draw the rough versions out, but hopefully that's good enough for you to see what the project will look like as a whole, okay? So let's talk about the first one. Project one, we want to set one of your projects in the real world, pretty important, okay? Real world being that you're mostly getting everything from real world references. You're not gonna make up this world from scratch, okay? So I chose maybe like a Tomb Raider kind of world. <clears throat> I like this kind of stuff. I like tombs, I like ancient buildings, I like kind of uh, stone things, right? So let's pick a Tomb Raider-ish world. So using that as my base, here's gonna break down my 10 images. Okay, I'm gonna do two character costumes. I think it's important because Tomb Raider games, you have a lead character doing all this, so I need that. Okay, generally they have a vehicle, like a truck or some kind of explore vehicle. So I just need one. I think that that's good enough for this project. I'm gonna do one prop. And one prop doesn't mean one prop. I could do a page of them. So for example, uh, if we're doing a Tomb Raider kind of character, maybe the lamp, a bag, maybe some weapons, some food supplies. I don't know. Let's just fill the page with a bunch of those kind of things, right? Just one page is enough. Now, in, environments are really important in a Tomb Raider's kind of game because you're going to explore these. So I'm going to do two environment exteriors, two environment interiors. And we'll probably do these in, in a breakdown format, okay? Mean three-quarter view, looking down, pretty detailed. But when I do, it's going to be pretty rough. But the, the point is to get these into that uh, stuff you saw earlier in the breakdown. And then whatever we like from here, we use that content to generate our two production paintings, okay? So maybe it's an environment uh, view for one of the paintings and the other one could be a vehicle driving towards something, that could be the other one. We decide that later. We need this first because without this, we don't know what our production painting is. So at the end of it, we have 10 images. And if you're learning at home, give yourself say two months. Okay, that's plenty of time. That's crazy long in the real world, okay? This in the real world, uh, maybe a month, uh, at most, right? So I'm giving you about double the amount of time to do all this work. So you should be able to do it. So in total, look, each one's two months. If you really focus and sit down and do it this way, you're gonna have six months, half a year. You might have a portfolio that gets you into your industry after six months, right? You could be sitting in the game studio six months from now. And that stuff happens with our students. They come in all fresh, don't know anything, you know, learning everything. A year later, they're sitting at some triple A, drinking a soda and working on video games, right? It does happen, but it takes work, okay? So this is uh, this is for you guys at home, all right? Give you some, some guide. And the main takeaway from the first project, all right? From the two minute project is learning how to use refs, show that you have common sense and you could do entertainment value, okay? What does this entertainment value mean? is because you're taking something from the real world, can you translate the real world to something more fun? Okay, so it's not exactly real, it's kind of a entertainment real, okay? So this first project, it's showing these three things, and that's really good. Now let's go to project number two. So I decided to do a sci-fi. You can make it a fantasy, depending on what you like. I like science fiction stuff, so I'm gonna do sci-fi. And I'm gonna do kind of a Wing Commander-ish thing, okay? Wing Commander-ish, Star Wars, uh, something like that, right? But uh, I'm choosing Wing Commander because I worked on a very early version of Wing Commander before, and I'll show you that later. So I'm gonna continue that project. Maybe I haven't touched it for 20 something years, 23 years, but let me go back to that. So a Wing Commander-ish game, vehicle is number one for sure. So now I'm gonna tailor this project to have probably three vehicle exteriors. I'm gonna do one vehicle interior just to show that I could do it. Two costume characters, I mean character costumes, I think that's pretty important, like space suits or something, I think kind of cool. Environments, not that big of a deal, I think in a space sim, so I'm gonna do just two. One interior, one exterior, I think that's enough. And based on that, 
I'll do two production paintings, right? Probably a spaceship flying around or something. So notice how I tailor each number count according to the theme I'm doing to show off the main selling point of this particular project. So I'll also end up with 10 images, two months, and this project is showing off these things that you could adopt new design languages, right? These spaceships obviously don't exist. You don't have to make them up. So you can have a, have a design language of some kind and you want to see, do you go super generic? Are you able to get away from the generic stuff that you see online and copy everybody else? Or can you come up with something that's interesting? We also think, can you make things look cool? Selling a space themed video game, cool is almost your number one priority. It just needs to look cool because none of it really makes sense, right? These spaceships probably don't even work in space. It doesn't matter long as they look cool okay so can you make things look cool last can you capture that imagination can you make this world that it's in space make it believable right look like star citizen these kind of games right they're doing that it looks cool they got own design language going on and it's definitely capturing my imagination to want to be in that world okay the last one earlier let's go back one slide notice i put your personal project here okay and that does apply we want to see what do you like. So this could be your own project. You could come up with something from scratch if you want, but it's a little harder. Or maybe you always had a certain design you want to, uh, like a book that you want to bring to life. Doesn't matter. This will cover your personal things. Just in case you get on an interview, they can ask you what this project was about. You have a lot more hard print to it because something that's very personal. So in our school, we have different ways to treat them. Sometimes the students will choose their own stuff. Sometimes we'll do things like a classic reboot off of a game, a classic movie, or a classic uh, a book, right? So in this case, I chose a game that I grew up with, which is Final Fantasy VI. I loved it, and I think they should redo really a reboot of it, okay? Like HD, just complete remake. It kind of like what they did with Final Fantasy VII, but of all the Final Fantasies, I actually like VI the most. So using that, I might do a vehicle so this is really about selling the world right final fantasy i think the world's number one but they do have airships so i love to do a airship exterior and an interior uh, they, their characters are very important so without two character maybe a creature like they ride those uh chocho balls right those big chicken things um environments are important so i'm gonna do two interior uh, environments and two interior exteriors right so that's a lot that's four environments for this piece and only two vehicles right but total is still 10. Using that, we're gonna generate two production paintings. So what are you showing off with this project? Well, you're showing that you're able to adopt the existing IPs. We're not copying them exactly. We're not drawing fan art because it doesn't exist, right? So, because this game came out so long ago, this is like mid 90s, somewhere around there, 94, 95, something like that, right? I was in high school when I played it. So it's gotta be 93, 94, somewhere around that time. So. The art is so old now, so ancient, just pixels. So can we take those pixels and make it still feel like it's from this IP? Pretty important. So that's going to show off. Can you adopt this IP? Are you able to upscale the details up to 4K without losing the original design? And the last one's kind of similar to that. Can you capture the overall mood so it doesn't feel like all of a sudden it's Metal Gear Solid, whereas all of a sudden it's Dark Souls, right? It still has to feel like this is actually fan of fantasy world. Can you do that? This is not easy, okay? Tell the truth. For all these projects, this one might be the hardest one for you to pull off. So if you're not comfortable with this kind of stuff, then go back and do another real world or do another uh, science five or fantasy or do a book reboot, whatever it is. So that's why I leave this category personal. Okay, do whatever you want. So these are three that I'll probably cover. Again, okay? I don't know. I can't promise anything. It depends on my schedule. But I'll try to do this in episode 107. Uh, oh, yeah, 107, 108, and 109. Okay, so let me take a quick break here, take a drink of water, and we'll come back and finish the rest of this episode off in one second. All right, I'm back here. We're doing pretty good on time, about an hour and 20 minutes in. So uh, let's continue here. So we're done with the portfolio uh, prep, and uh, this will also give me enough content for the next few episodes. I hope I'll try my best to stick with it. No promises right now, but I'll try my best. Because even making this list, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm like, man, this looks fun, man. I want to draw this. Because I don't get to draw much these days. And uh, when I saw this, I'm like, man, this looks fun. Even if I just do roughs, uh, like the kind of stuff I did in episode 105, just let's keep it about sketch level but that's that's kind of fun and i want to do that so let's try to stick to that okay next okay salary expectations i'll run through this really quickly it's not a big deal but uh, i also covered this in previous episodes but since we are talking about jobs let's talk about this real quick uh this is pretty average here this is u.s uh average salaries 
over there so let's go from the let's go from bottom to top this time okay so a junior artist coming in into a u.s based studio you're looking at somewhere between forty-five thousand to about sixty-five thousand a year pretty common this is where most of our students land if you're working for a big studio and they have a lot of money they might run even higher but this is about the average so anything lower are considered too low especially if you're living say in los angeles 45k in los angeles it's okay, but it's not great because the city is so expensive. If you're making 45K, say in Austin, Texas, might be a little bit better. Their, their style of living is a little bit cheaper. But again, you can negotiate that. But this is where junior artists generally starts. Now, I'll make it very clear. This is if you're in the U.S. where you're working for U.S. companies. If you're working in a different country, the studio is also in that country. They're going to pay with local rates because it makes no sense for a studio that's, say, based in uh, Malaysia to pay you U.S. salary when they're, they're themselves in Malaysia, right? So this is just for U.S. because this is where I do most of my work as well with U.S. companies. Okay, so concept artists in general make about sixty-five to about ninety thousand a year, depending on your experience. Senior guys make about nine to one hundred twenty. So now I start to make pretty good money, uh, especially if you're in LA. Uh, LA, big at 100K, gives you comfortable living-ish. LA is super, super expensive. So, but this is where most uh, most concept artists is pretty comfortable at. Art directors. 130 and up. All right, I've seen much higher numbers than this as well. If you're really, really good, where you ship some really good products behind you, or you're you're really good as an art director, like you, you can actually get people to join you. Because art director skills is not just you draw well. Art director has to be able to communicate well, guide people well, and also has enough pull power to get teams to join them. Okay. For example, you join a company, you can pull like, hey man, you know, maybe within the next month I could get 10 really good concept artists to come to my studio right so students will look for that you know art director say you're someone like um let's say like daniel duku right from uh, guild wars he's over at i think it's at amazon now so guys like him has a huge following they're really good they're very easy to communicate with i like i'll work for him you know what i'm saying if daniel calls me i'll totally do projects with him because he's uh, very fun to work with so these art directors are highly valued and their salary is going to be uh, very high because of that right because they could put a team together really really well and of course the last one which is the rarest job to get is a creative director so now you're executive you have shares in the company you are basically the highest highest in the studio now so easily you're getting about two hundred thousand easy uh, and that comes with share options that could be in the millions as well so that, but that we don't have to worry about now let's worry about this one okay so our first job let's try to get that 45 to 65k if you're a junior artist let's get in there okay in the u.s so i know we, we have a very international crowd so this only applies in the u.s in different countries different rates okay but if you're freelancing for a u.s company you can ask for this okay so say let's go back you're in malaysia but the company is in uh, america based you could then command a u.s uh, hourly rate that should be completely fair because i don't think it's fair for a u.s company to pay the local rate of your country if they're not even there themselves, right? So they should pay whatever their rate is based on where they are headquarters. So uh, anyway, so that's a very uh, simple uh, breakdown of the salaries. And I'll kind of talk about my past here as the last part here, which is my first industry jobs. So I'll share a little bit of my background of how I got in. I even share my salary, what I got there, so you guys can know what I did. And my first three jobs. So I did three different companies within three years. Uh, is that three? Two years, two years. I did three companies in three, uh, two years. Uh, this is because I got into the industry right at the peak of the game industry going on fire. Okay, some of you guys might be old enough to know that the mid 90s to the about early 2000s, the golden age of gaming, this is where all your major games were being established. So, when I was working during this time, we had games like, uh, like Half Life come out, right? Really, truly defined first person shooter. We had games like Baldur's Gate come out there's just all these iconic games and nobody knows what the game industry is going to be like in the next few years 3d like nvidia was barely on the market they weren't really even making 3d cars at the point they were being made by 3d effects right so the industry is so new and everyone's trying to get in investors just pouring millions of dollars into the sector and everybody was starting game companies so i got lucky i got in at the kind of a good time to be in so i was getting offers left and right so i'll stay there finish a product and go immediately to another one and then go to another one because the offers were really really good at the time uh, this right now is obviously not around anymore because the game industry now is very mature it's more stabilized the pipelines also established but in the 90s it was a it's a wild wild west because nobody really knew what's going on uh, there was really no standardized game engines at the point i think unreal was in version one right because i worked with cliffy b on uh, uh unreal tournament as well as gears of war that was that was i think early 2000s and they were one of the few that started to sell their engine but uh, when I got in, engines was still an internal thing. Like Half-Life had their own, Unreal had their own. Everyone's making their own. So it's really, really crazy. But anyways, 
Let's talk about my first job. Okay, look at this embarrassing art, right? So I got into my first job, full-time job, uh, after I got an art center, was at Virgin System, which is now EA, actually. They got bought out. So Virgin was a really big studio back in the 97s. So they made it the first MMO, graphical MMO game in the world, which is Ultima Online. So I got in uh, when Ultima Online was really, really big. So it was pretty fun because I played a little bit of it as well. So it was kind of cool to go to the studio that was making Ultima Online. Uh, they also made all the previous Ultima games as well. And they also made the Wing Commander games. For those of you who played it, they're classic space game that define the space genre, right? Chris Roberts, so who is now making uh, Star Citizen, which is similar to this, uh, to this stuff. So I got in there to work on Wing Commander Online, which unfortunately was canceled because Ultima Online did really well that the Warjin wanted to make a uh, space version, basically, of an MNO called Wing Commander Online or Freelancer Online. They're similar, similar IP. So I was hired to basically draw spaceships. So you can see this is just a very small collection of what I've done there. Generally, I do about four to five of these a day at the studio. So I stayed there for about six months. I wasn't there too long. I got in late 97. I got in, I think I left in January or February of 98. So I was there for just about six months to seven months. And the reason for that is because as soon as they, they got bought out by Electronic Arts, all the executives from Origin started to leave and start their own companies. And I joined one of those startups, which I'll show you later. So this is just the early sketches. You can see as a junior artist, I was still doing some pretty cool stuff, but this is work, right? They didn't ask me to do production paintings. Actually, that concept wasn't even around back then. This is so early. Concept art was still being formed during those days. Like that, the title didn't even exist. So my first job, I didn't have a concept artist job position because it didn't exist. My job was, uh, I think my title was senior artist level three or something crazy like so so like corporate you know uh that's the kind of title of the game they actually give me a senior title not because i was senior it's because the salary i got which i can share with you so my first job my starting salary was fifty five thousand a year with a ten thousand dollar bonus so total sixty five thousand in 97 so if you convert that over to today's currency uh it's about over a hundred and five thousand which is really high okay for 97 so the reason why it's really high is because game companies during that time was just trying to eat up every concept artist they could find because they're so rare. There's just a few people doing it at the time, maybe 30 to 40 people on the whole world doing uh, cater to concept art for video games. So little. So these big studios just trying to grab and they use salaries or high salaries to pull you into their studios. So I accepted that, that job offer at that rate and it was very comfortable. I was 21 years old, uh, making pretty good money in Austin, Texas. So that was my first gig, and I was asked to just draw spaceships all day. And uh, they're also modular, so you could take one wing and snap into another one. These are all Chris Roberts' uh, ideas, right? So we have the Kurathi. How do you spell these guys? Kurathi, right? So just to share how big this project was, I was responsible for all the human side and the Kurathi side of the spaceships. And for the alien side, they actually hired Sid Mead to do, which is crazy, right? So my first job, the other designer was Sid Mead, but he was doing remotely. He was in Los Angeles. I actually moved physically to Austin, Texas, but uh, every few weeks we'll get Sid's drawings back and put on the wall. So it was very intimidating because I'm putting up my drawings and there's like Sid Mead's drawings right next to it. But it was a great experience to be able to work with Sid on such a crazy IP. So that was fun. So let me show you a few more sketches from that. Here's some black and whites from that project as well, right? From uh, from from the seven, six to seven months I stayed there. So here are just sketches. You can see just design, figuring out the spaceships, right? They uh, they have all these cool ideas like tugs that you can actually land ships inside other ships. So I'm pretty sure these ideas all exist now, but this is pretty far ahead of its time in 97, 98. Like nobody was doing this and we're trying to figure everything out as we go. Uh, we want a spaceship to land physically in space stations for you to walk out and go to a bar. These are all the things that you see in Star Citizen do now, but Chris wanted to do that back in the early 90s, which is crazy because the game engines, we didn't even know how to do it. Like how do you get out of a spaceship and go into a space station, go into a bar, all of it without low time. Uh, it was it was fun. It was kind of cool because everyone was involved. It's not just like the programmers talking about it. Like I'm involved, you know, trying to come up with ideas. How do we hide it? So you guys probably saw the Mass Effect the elevator, right? Using the elevator to hide the load screen. Those are kind of things we're trying to do. Like, okay, maybe we go into a garage, like so it looks seamless, but the garage actually is a load, right? And then after you get out of the garage, the spaceship loads, but it feels seamless. But we use the garage and all the arms putting your engines off as a load transition. So that was a lot of fun because you get to sh use your brain to help the team come up with concepts, and they're using you really as a designer and not just the risk of drawing things, right?
so yeah, this was a lot of fun. I had a blast working on this because first full time job, I was 21 years old. I don't know what the hell is going on. Uh, just work on video games during the day and play video games at night. So I was uh, playing like Final Fantasy VII and uh, I think what came, uh, Half Life, of course. Uh, just playing all these games, just be amazed that the industry was so awesome. Right? Early 90s or mid 90s games are just one of a kind. Uh, I, I missed that time, time period. Okay, so after EA or Warjin, I went to GT Interactive. So I got recruited. Because I did a lot of concept art, I filled the walls over at EA, uh, pretty much the entire wall was filled with concept art. So that got the attention of a lot of executives. So when they're branching off to start their own company, one of the first things they need is concept art. Because at the time, keep in mind, this is 22 years ago or 21 years ago, the way to sell these games really, you need concept art, right? So, uh, so I was hired really early on to do this RPG game for GT Interactive. Unfortunately, this game never shipped either. So now I'm two games in a row that never shipped, right? So Wing Commander never came out. Uh, and then GT Interactive, this game never came out either. We, never, we didn't even have a game, uh, name for this. We just called it Action RPG. As you can see, it's called Action RPG. Uh, because back then, Baldur's Gate was doing really, really well. So we wanted to, uh, GT Interactive wanted to make a 3D version of Baldur's Gate, kind of like uh, Neverwinter Nights. Uh, I, I don't even know Neverwinter was out back then. I think it was out, Neverwinter Nights. I think it was out. But anyway, it's kind of like a 3D, D&D, rule-based uh, RPG, right? So that's what I worked on. It was pretty cool. We got it to, into playable phase, but then GT Interactive, I think they went under or something like that. Uh, they were moving from New York to LA, and that apparently caused a huge bank up, bankruptcy issue, something like that. So the company only lasted about a few years before they went belly up. So but I spent about a year here and it was a lot of fun as well because I never done fantasy much. I always done sci-fi. So all of a sudden I jumped to this project and the thing I talked about earlier, right? Being a concept, being a junior artist, you have to be very diverse. You have to have a large set of skills. Uh, even though in school I never done fantasy, uh, when I joined this project, they actually the first one they wanted to do was a fantasy, I mean, it was a space project. That's why they hired me. They want me to do this kind of a basically a clone of a wing commander, right? They're doing this space shooting game. But a few months in, the exec decided to, hey, let's not do that. Right now, Baldur's Gate is selling like hotcakes. You know, RPG is selling like hotcakes right now. Let's do RPG games. So we threw all that stuff away and then go straight to fantasy. And I, I was freaking out. I was like, man, I don't draw fantasy, man. I've never done it before. But you adopt, right? I start quickly looking at fantasy reference images and just try to draw stuff. So here's some villages. We got a date on this. It's 22 years ago. It's 98 right there. <clears throat> I still had a lot of fun. And all this is traditional, by the way. This is not on paper. Uh, we didn't draw on Photoshop back in the day. So this is all done on 8.5 by 11 paper with pen, marker, and gouache. Okay. So pretty fun because there was really nothing out there at the time. There's nothing you could look at. It's not like you go to art station and see what people are doing. There's not, you can't even look at other games. They just didn't exist. So you're coming up with these just crazy worlds because at the time, the polygon count was so low that you have to use big forms, big shapes, everything big so, so, so things read well. And that gives you some good visuals, in my opinion. Here's a couple more. So I also done pretty much everything. I was the only concept artist in the studio. So going back to even Wing Commander, this one, uh, this studio had about 300 people at the time, and I was the first uh, full-time hired concept artist. I never worked a concept designer before. So it was pretty weird. There's no one to work with. I don't have a teammate. I'm just by myself drawing spaceships. Uh, same here. This team was about 30 people, and I was the only concept artist there, So, which is good because that means you do everything. You do the characters, the props, the environments, everything. So at that time, there was no lead. There was, no, there was nothing. I didn't even have an art director. It was just me. So... Um, that's the early days of concept art, right? So I was doing characters, my characters, uh, the game was like the magic was uh, not used. The magic has to be generated by machines. So these guys have these kind of crazy gloves and they could then cast magic with that. So uh, look at this thing, the blade. I always like this um, wrist blade thing that I eventually used for Blood Rain, uh, for the character Blood Rain that I put it on her later. That's about three years later that I used the same, similar design for that. Uh, so here's some crazy. <laughs> I still remember these are so old, but it's kind of fun to look at these. This is a reptile creature that when it gets angry, his little uh, muscles tense up. But when he's not angry, he's really skinny looking. Oh, yeah, yeah, here we go. You can see it there. So at the time, I think it was just so fun to come up with these things that are just very creative, I guess, in a way, uh, because there was not much limitation in terms of what the game industry is expecting because everything was literally the first. So like this game comes out first, first of this kind. You know, this game comes first of that kind. So it was a lot of fun. Here's a creature that... Um, Big giant walker, is a, I call it the, uh, the dumb mole creature. You know, look at him. <clears throat> you know, more characters or crazy uh, weapons. Here's the blade again that I really like. 
All right, a few more. Just wild stuff, a lot of fun. Okay, almost done over here. So after GT Interactive went, uh, went bankrupt, but I, here I'm already in Los Angeles. I was working out in, uh, wait, where am I? No, I'm still in Austin, Texas, sorry. So here I'm still in Texas, in Austin. And after GT went belly up, I moved back to LA and got recruited into another startup, this time by the guys over from Westwood. So, because EA, when they bought out Origin, they also bought out Westwood. Uh, again, this is old, old stuff. Some of you guys might know that. So Westworld created a few games. One of the most famous one being Command and Conquer. And the other one being, for example, I think they also made like Carandia. Right? They made a few games, but Command and Conquer being their biggest uh, IP. So that got absorbed by Electronic Arts. So then executives leave, right? So they get their cash payout and they go form companies with the cash payout. So they, the founder of, not founder, but one of the uh, designers of Command and Conquer from Westworld went to LA and started a new company and recruited me to work on their new RTS game because it comes from RTS. So this is called Battle Realms. So this game actually shipped, which is awesome. So this is my first shipped product uh, on a game. All right, so this is 1999. So I worked on Battle Realms, also the only designer in house. This is a very small team. I think it's about also about 30 people uh, working out in uh, Los Angeles. So I was doing all the characters and I'm, I'm not really good at this stuff. I got, again, recruited into a fantasy role, which I don't really do too much of at the time. So these are horrible looking, but uh, for 90s, I guess this is how it was back then. And being an RTS, everything is chunky. Everything's big because the polygon for these was about 300 polys per character. So you didn't have that much to go. So everything's exaggerated, like huge hammers and you know, huge, <laughs> everything's big. So it was a lot of fun. Those three factions in this game. It's a 3D uh, RTS game. So there weren't many of this back in the days as well. Uh, Blizzard at the time was doing Warcraft 3. So I actually had some friends over there. So I actually went down to Blizzard a few times to look at their progression because these two games are literally happening at the same time. So I was working on Battle Realms and then uh, on the weekends, I'll go down to Blizzard down in Irvine to see what my friends were doing on Warcraft 3, uh, the RTS version. So it was pretty fun. So uh, here's some buildings from the same thing. I've done a ton. These are just a small snippet of what I've done. The buildings, I think uh, when I was putting this together, my folder had about 160 of these in my folder. The character is also about 120. So because everything, you're the only concept artist you're doing. I even did the UI for this game. So every vehicle, I mean, uh, every building, every character, every prop, UI, the grass. I even painted the grass tiles for the game. So, but this is how it was in the early 90s. Then, but the reason why I wanted to show you this, oh, sorry, not early 90s, late 90s. The reason why I want to show you this is to show you the amount of work that I was generating on a daily basis in case a junior artist. And I still keep this uh, work ethics even today. Right? I don't like to waste my time when I'm on the clock. I want to make sure that what I'm doing, I'm putting 100% of myself in it. So if you're a junior artist, your first job, especially if you're just gone to the game industry, I mean, this is fun. You know, I'm 22 years later, 23 years later, I'm still enjoying this industry because I think it's the weirdest job on the planet that people pay you to, to draw fun stuff for video games. So hopefully this inspires you guys to see that this is what you need to build in your portfolio, okay? You have your personal stuff that you do for fun, always do that. But if you want to break into the game industry, you got to start thinking as a production artist. Make sure your portfolio has these things that, that I talked about today, right? You don't have to do all of them, but at least have some of these in your portfolio. And that will get you into this business, okay? So so today's episode, I think we're coming to a, to a close here to show you a few more of this Battle Realm stuff. You can find this on GOG. There's still a crazy fan base. I mean, not that big. There's still people out there playing this game even today. So uh, we had a pretty good concept for this as well back in the time. It's because uh, you know, our CEO came from Westworld, came from Command and Conquer. So we're trying to break the mode. So I think in this game, like every character could become any other character. So that was a new gameplay style. So a peasant could become a warrior. The warrior could become like some other thing. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. All right, so here's a wolf clan, some samurai stuff, it's chimney. Everything's big, everything's iconic because the, the asset in the game is like a tiny little icon. So you have to make sure that everything's nice and huge. Right? So the cool thing is years later, I actually ended up working for EA in oh, 2004, maybe 2005. So I ended up, they hired me to work on the uh, reboot of Command & Conquer. So that was fun. It was kind of a whole circle going around. So I worked on Command & Conquer Tiberian Wars. I think that's what's called. And also worked on Red Alert 3, I think. Did a bunch of units for those games. A lot of fun. So, uh, and I think those games did quite well as well. So anyway, so hopefully this whole entire episode inspired you guys to rethink about your portfolio or to look at what you have now, see what you're missing, and spend the next maybe six months or so building up a proper portfolio. 
All right, and that means you gotta start go draw. Okay, that's the final slide over here. So today we're coming to an end here. So episode 107, I'll try to jump in and do our first project. Let me just see. I almost forgot what it was. I think it's a two meter project. All right. Uh, this one okay so episode 107 i'll try my best to do this one okay real world project tomb raider ish thing we'll try to get all these roughed out uh we'll see before that i might do a q a before we get to that but uh it's coming soon all right so thank you guys for sharing this time with me on the, on this class and i'll see you guys in episode 107 this is Fenzu signing off see you guys next time Bye bye